Hello and welcome to today's session um, I, that I will be chairing. My name is Sabrina Dimitra and our session today will be called Supporting Migrant Workers as Essential Workers, the Challenges and Training Needs of Service Providers During the Pandemic. So we will be having four different presentations today, followed by a Q&A session at the end. So I will be presenting today on the challenges and training needs of service providers during the pandemic. As I mentioned already, my name is Sabrina Dimitra, and I'm AMSA Settlement and Integration Program Manager. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the AMSA office is located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Just a little bit about AMSA and who we are before we get started. AMSA, the Affiliation of Multicultural Societies and Service Agencies of BC, is British Columbia's province-wide umbrella association with over 80 member organizations who build culturally inclusive communities. AMSA, the province of BC is divided up into five different regions and AMSA has members located throughout the region. The AMSA office is located in the Metro Vancouver region, which is here highlighted in green on the slide. We will be hearing presentations from the Vancouver Island region, which is in purple, Fraser Valley, which is yellow, and the North region, which is in blue. So we believe that there are approximately 115 service locations across BC who identify as organizations that support migrant workers. And so while the exact number is unclear um, in terms of organizations who provide supports to migrant workers, either funded or unfunded services, the research and the collaboration that we've done with organizations who provide services suggests the following when it comes to the number and the types of organizations providing support to migrant workers. In a service mapping survey, and I'll be talking about that shortly, we identified 115 different service locations across BC who provide services to migrant workers. These service locations include not only organizations who are specifically funded to support migrant workers, which includes approximately 50 organizations who receive settlement and integration services funding through the province of British Columbia, but other organizations who self-identify as supporting migrant workers. Some of those include self-organized community-based groups, religious institutions, educational institutions, and many more. These do not receive the traditional funding to support migrant workers, but are able to provide supports through other means of, of funding, such as self-fundraising donations, and also through fee-for-service. At AMSA, we have two projects that we are currently funded and are working on that focus on supporting organizations that, that support migrant workers. So the, the projects um, are not directly intended for migrant workers as the client recipients, but the supports are for all the organizations. And those two are building capacity to support BC's migrant workers and the WorkSafe BC project. The building capacity to support BC's migrant workers was launched on March 4th of 2019. This project is funded by the Government of Canada's Migrant Workers Support Network, BC Pilot, which is led by Employment and Social Development Canada. And the objectives are to provide capacity and, and enhance the knowledge of all various different types of organizations that support migrant workers in BC pr by providing them with tools, resources, and training opportunities. Sorry. The WorkSafe BC project, which AMSA also conducts, started only recently in April of 2020, and it's funded by WorkSafe BC. WorkSafe BC is a provincial agency with a mandate to oversee a non-fault insurance system for the workplace in the, in the province. And the objective of this project is to enhance the capacity of organizations through service mapping and creating a an needs assessment and tools that are specifically related to WorkSafe BC resources and 
the mandate of WorkSafe BC. So through these two projects, we've identified a number of challenges that service providers in BC face when it comes to su supporting migrant workers. And the COVID-19 pandemic has not created many of these, of these challenges and that, that have been identified. They really amplify these challenges faced by service providers and have really shown a spotlight on many of the systemic barriers of the temporary foreign worker program. But what we've heard repeatedly from organizations is a lack of funding, the lack of resources as being the largest challenge in supporting migrant workers. As well, we've heard two other areas of where there's challenges in terms of accessibility and outreach. So that is um, difficulties in connecting with migrant workers in rural areas, migrant workers being unaware of the services and supports, service providers unaware of others in the region who can also work to, who can also support workers through a collaborative approach. As well, the second large area where we've heard challenges is around the lack of specific migrant worker information and training. And more specifically was around government information. So we've heard from service providers that government information has been available and it's been available in an overflow during the pandemic with information changing very, very frequently. However, it wasn't always clear to organizations and individuals supporting migrant workers if that information and was specifically applicable to migrant workers. And for example, if it was regarding certain benefits if migrant workers were eligible. And so this really created a time consuming, challenging time um, in terms of accessing these resources and, and being able to navigate that for service providing organizations. As well, we've heard through the survey that 57% of organizations said that they have been receiving more requests for, for support from migrant workers since the start of the pandemic. 16% said that due to the pandemic that they've started to, to provide online services. And we've also heard from some service providers, namely 5% said that due to the pandemic um, and the, the challenges of funding that they were no longer able to provide any services to migrant workers. So looking at the data in terms of the, the number of migrant workers in BC, you'll see um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see two data columns with 2019, 2020, both of them being from March, from January to March. And so there was a 10% drop in labor market assessment LMIA applications during the time frame from January to March of 2020 compared to 2019. As well on the right side, you'll see the labor market impact assessment applications between April and June 2019, as well as 2020. And you'll see that there's a 27% drop in approved positions compared to April to June timeframe of 2019. And so it's important to note that receiving a positive LMIA does not mean that a work permit has been issued, nor does it represent the actual number of migrant workers who came to BC during the pandemic. And that the numbers in the table do not reflect the, the temporary foreign worker positions outside of the temporary foreign worker program, such as temporary foreign workers who arrived here under the international mobility program as well. And so based on everything that we've heard through both of our projects with all the different changes and the needs of organization and at AMSA, we looked and aimed to create various different resources to address the needs of service providers. And so we hosted COVID-19 specific webinars, created a COVID-19 fact page on the Migrant Worker Hub, provided and created the, the service map, held regional meetings, are gonna be holding WorkSafe specific workshop as, as well as many other resources that we're looking to create. So in terms of the specific COVID-19 related webinars, we held webinars on topics of medical services, employment standards, mental health care, income supports, as well as health and safety. The Migrant Worker Hub, um, which is 
the website where all of these different resources can be found. And that is really the centralized hub for all of AMSA's resources that are related around migrant workers can be found at migrantworkerhub.ca. And so this is really a digital center for all of the resources that we have. Um, and we also have a quarterly newsletter that you can sign up to receive information about all the latest resources and, and online events that we're offering. As well, another important aspect of the resources that we've released recently was the Migrant Worker Support Service Map, um, which is part of our WorkSafe BC project. And so this map can be found on the AMSA website under the Resources tab. And the intent of this map was to connect organizations and individuals with others who support migrant workers in BC. And so the map currently has over 100 various different service locations where organizations um, who support migrant workers are listed and the map is searchable by region, but also by specific service type. As well on the map, information that is included includes information regarding organizational websites, addresses, contact information, types of services, but also the languages that are provided in, in the supports provided in those various different languages. AMSA, we've also been hosting regional meetings to service providers supporting migrant workers around the province. Last year, we did this all in person in Nanaimo, Prince George and Kelowna, three communities on, one on Vancouver Island, one in the north and one in the interior of the province. And this year instead we've been hosting, four, we're gonna be hosting four virtual regional meetings to continue that conversation. Two of those meetings, the north and the interior meeting we've already completed. And we will be looking to host the Metro Vancouver Fraser Valley meeting next week and the Vancouver Island regional meeting in January. And so we've been hearing during these meetings presentations around labor legislation changes and updates from the BC Ministry of Labor, discussing occupational health and safety and emergency response planning, access to health care, which is so vital during these times, HR challenges and, and strategies also for employers, as employers and employee associations are also part of the project. And, and looking to access some of those resources as well. We've been hearing from different researchers as well as looking and discussing the topic on protecting migrant, migrant worker rights as human rights. And so we're also gonna be hosting and very shortly um, in December and in January, three workshops that are specific to WorkSafe BC training. And so these three training days are gonna be on workplace health and safety regulations, workplace injury, and enforcement and inspection. And all of these three topics will be held in relationship to migrant workers um, and, and the rights and what organizations need to know in terms of supporting migrant workers on these topics. As well, we've been looking to create numerous upcoming resources. And so we have a couple different info sheets and videos that are gonna be coming out shortly. We're looking at intercultural communication, a guide to um, work safe BC mental health claims for migrant workers, an online video on the right to refuse unsafe work. We're, all of our resources are guided by the advisory committee that we have that advises us on what the different topics are needed. And so in discussion right now are our webinars on the topic of employment rights and protections and, and also in terms of filing taxes. We've also looked to create various different e-learning modules on the overview of the Temporary Foreign Worker Program will be co coming out next week. And if you're interested in taking that module, you can um, send us an email and I'll, sh I'll share just in a moment how you can connect with us. The e-learning module on the open work permit and the rights of migrant workers will be coming out shortly. And so we, we welcome you to stay connected to AMSA and the work that we do and all the various different resources. So you can send an email to migrantworkerhub at amsa.org. You can also visit the Migrant Worker website, migrantworkerhub.ca, or also you can come and visit our exhibitor booth here at the P2P conference. And our, our exhibitor booth is listed under AMSA. 
And so I just wanted to, to say thank you so much and also to share my email. In case you had any specific questions, please feel free to connect with me. And thank you. And I will be handing it now over to my colleague, Lynn Weaver, who will be continuing and will be presenting. I'd like to extend my thanks to AMSA and to the co-presenters today and to Pathways to Prosperity for hosting this important gathering and pivoting with the times. I'd also like to thank the provincial government in BC for supporting service delivery for migrant workers. My name is Lynn Taylor Weaver and I'm here with you today from the Halkamina Mustweam territory, specifically Cowetson lands where I am here today. And I acknowledge my inherent and unearned privilege as a settler on these lands. I'm the director at the Cowichan Intercultural Society and the chair of the Pathways to Prosperity Standing Committee on Immigration to Northern Rural and Remote Communities. And as Sabrina already shared, uh, this information is specific to our BC context and in my case to Vancouver Island. Um, so the Cowichan Intercultural Society serves a large geographic rural region uh, which hosts many migrant workers. I'm looking with you today at what the pandemic has revealed about migrant workers in Canada and how that impacts service delivery in support of migrant workers. We've heard similar things today uh, in other presentations at the conference. This is a hot topic at the moment, it seems, but um, I think I can echo some of the important messages without duplication here. And I'm sure you're all well versed in the temporary foreign worker program, but uh, in order to practice inclusion, I'd like to cover some starting points for our conversation today. Through the temporary foreign worker program, most migrant workers are tied to a specific employer, what's called a closed work permit. And this has the potential to create feelings of vulnerability or instability for the workers and has the potential to create room for abuse with employers. There's also a complex regulatory environment between Employment and Social Development Canada, ESDC, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, who are responsible for permanent pathways, CBSA, Canadian Border Service Agency, who represent the ever-present threat of deportation, um, provincial and territorial employment standards, the individual employers and the industries or sectors that, that they are part of. So there's, you know, this, this complex web in which we need to be mindful migrant workers don't fall through the cracks. So by rendering a growing number of people as non-immigrant, non-permanent residents, we are essentially regulating a racialized and gendered labor market, legitimizing differential treatment of migrant workers vis-a-vis -vis temporary status. So without going too far down the rabbit hole, to me, this does call into question the ethics of the program as a whole. Is it ethical to import humans as what appears to be dispensable labor? So most quote unquote imported labor is low waged and so-called unskilled or low skilled. Um, at first glance, for example, uh, it appears if you look at uh, hopefully it's not blocking on your screen, you can see 2015. It looks like high wage positions outnumber low wage, but the majority of primary agriculture and caregiving positions are also low wage. So when taken together, for example, in 2015, it's over 680,000 low waged. Um, and regardless of the total number, the balance is roughly the same year over year, about 75% of total migrant workers are in low waged categories. This came up earlier today, so glad to highlight that. So there's already pre-existing risk factors and very few systemic protective factors. And then of course we entered a global pandemic. So looking through a filter of intersectionality, the quote unquote COVID doesn't discriminate and neither should you tagline doesn't hold up. In fact, we're not all in this together. As we know, a significant amount of the work that was deemed essential was carried out by migrant workers. And most of these are roles that are not generally able to telecommute. So food, supply related, and healthcare. 
this chart shows the proportion of migrant workers by industry. To be clear, this isn't saying, for example, that 27.4% of migrant workers are in crop production. It's saying that 274 of all crop production in Canada is done by migrant workers. So just let that land for a moment. In fact, temporary farm workers account for 41.6% of the agricultural workers in Ontario and over 30% of the agricultural workers in Quebec, British Columbia and Nova Scotia. So migrant workers, in addition to all of this during the pandemic have been facing racism and discrimination more than ever. I wanna point out the slogan on her sign in the top left, good enough to work, good enough to stay. It's an apt way to sum it up, right? Okay, so that was our starting points. There is good news. Uh, for example, the Ontario Labor Relations Board recently ruled in favor of a migrant worker against an employer that fired him for speaking out about health and safety concerns amid a COVID-19 outbreak at the facility. And the court acknowledged the difference in the employer-employee relationship vis-a-vis -vis the temporary foreign worker program. So that's good news. And the Office of the Auditor General is conducting another review. We look forward to the results of that. There's also good work being done to highlight the contributions of migrant workers, for example, via local immigration partnerships and Réseau Francophone. Um, and the provinces and territories across Canada are stepping up to bridge that gap that exists between the federal program and the provincial employment standards. So in BC, for example, individual recruiters must be licensed in BC, even if their business or main operations are located outside the province. And recruiters who operate without a license could be fined up to $10,000. So there, there is a you know, significant encouragement. Um, and employers who want to hire migrant workers will be required to register with the province as of December 15th of this year. And there's no fee to, reg to register, so there's no deterrent there. And the BC Temporary Foreign Worker Protection Act passed in the fall of 2018. Other provinces in Canada have registration requirements for employers of foreign workers as well, including Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Nova Scotia. So government is listening to and addressing needs. And in BC, the province also funds some services and supports in support of migrant workers. So at the Couch and Intercultural Society, we deliver these services and supports. And here's a brief look at who we serve in terms of sector and um, country of origin. And it's important to note the majority of migrant workers in our region are female. And as you may notice, that percentage corresponds exactly to the percentage of so-called low-skilled occupations. I'm not making it up. It was literally <laughs> the exact amount. Uh, we provided more assistance to temporary foreign workers during the pandemic. There was a tremendous amount of uncertainty around income support for those who were laid off from their jobs. Sabrina touched on a lot of this already, but um, other aspects were that some were worried that their eventual success in the provincial nominee program would be compromised if they accessed emergency relief benefits. Um, other worried, others worried about questions like, are you available for work when they filled out their emergency relief reporting forms since they were available but couldn't work for other employers because they were on a closed work permit. There was much concern about what would happen to them if the businesses that had done the labor market impact assessment went out of business. And in general, they experienced a lot of stress and needed extra support during this time. I would like to acknowledge AMSA, ESDC and others for attempting to disseminate timely information even while that information was changing rapidly. So on that, what was needed for more effective provision of service, a repository of information um, like what's housed through the Migrant Hub uh, site, but some something specifically for um, agencies that are serving migrant workers to, to better access that information rather than threads and threads of emails, the ability to do outreach as Sabrina touched on, um, and a discussion around what this looks like during a pandemic. We know, for example, that migrant workers often have access to technology and access to transportation tied to their employer. Services should be in the worker's language wherever possible and looking at how we can better come alongside employers so that they see us as a, as a supporter uh, 
in supporting their business by having a healthy and resourced workforce. So perhaps by the new employee register, employer register rather in BC, for example. Okay, more good news. The there was a federal announcement recently, as I'm sure you all saw, regarding permanent residency for healthcare workers. Unfortunately, this applied only to asylum seekers who had submitted a claim prior to COVID. So it's a small number of people, but it is a gesture in the right direction, and we're hoping to see more uh, from that today. Now, I don't think my audience today is such that this needs mentioning, but often an economic argument is used for not granting permanent pathways for migrant workers. So I just want to point out that an enormous amount of money leaves Canada when workers send money home. If their family was here in Canada, they wouldn't need to do that. Good enough to work, good enough to stay. Thank you. Merci. I'd now like to welcome our next presenter, Claudia Storr. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Claudia Storr. Um, I would like to present today and like to say thank you everybody for this uh, invitation. Uh, our presentation is titled Archway Community Service Experience during the COVID-19 helping temporary foreign workers and seasonal farm workers. About us, Registered in 1969, Archway Community Service is a non-profit, multi-service, multi-funded, community-based social service agency. The agency was previously known as Abbotsford Community Service from 1995 until 2019, when we changed our name to be more inclusive to the communities we serve outside of Abbotsford. Our 400 plus staff members and 1,000 plus volunteers provide service at 24 locations in Abbotsford, Chiliwa, Mission, Langley, and Chardigan, India, who we assist. The legal advocacy for agriculture workers provide assistance to farm workers in Punjabi, Spanish, English, Hindi, Mandarin, and Vietnamese. And the migrant workers program assists migrant workers on one-on-one -on -one basis as well in a group educational sessions. The Legal Advocacy Program provides full representation on a variety of issues, including employment standards and pay wages, residential tenancy, employment insurance, regular and sickness benefits, Canada Pension Plan Disability, Work CBC, Social Assistance, Canada Pension Plan, all age security pension, human rights. And this is the service for migrant workers. Ensure that relevant information on the rights, responsibilities, and obligations of the migrant workers are presented to them in a consistent and timely manner, assisting with premature or non-complex work permits. Guiding workers through the work CBC process if they are injured, assistant in complaint, parental, or sickness applications, access to information sessions, and help first to increase awareness and education. Ensure legal redress for migrant workers by working with lawyers and other legal professionals organization and government agencies of all levels. Identify access and address policies and legislation to improve the working conditions of migrant workers. Network with service providers in BC and conduct information sessions to highlight the main issues affecting migrant workers. Archway is continuing essential service while also finding new ways 
to serve the most vulnerable in our community. In March 2020, when we started to see the number of people infected with COVID-19 virus started to rise in BC, our program at Archway Community Service decided continue working and helping temporary foreign workers and farm workers. Help was focused on educating and giving correct information as everyday circumstances change. We start getting messages from seasonal farm workers from Mexico asking if their flights will be canceled. So we maintain communication with the Mexican consulate in Vancouver and some employer so that we could answer these questions. Gradually, some employers use charter flights for workers to get to Canada and then some countries like Mexico started flying a few days a week. The workers keep coming to Vancouver and we then we receive messages of thanks for maintaining communication with them. But also some questions and suggestions such as about the food they receiving at the hotel with which the first 14 days of mandatory isolation when they arrive. Our, uh, our work was focused on bring food like snacks so they had something to eat between meals. Then we saw they need to help them by handing out face masks, gloves and antibacterial gel by the time they were going to be off their farm. We began to receive messages from some workers who their employers would not allow them to leave their farms. So we, with some other organizations, submit the complaint to ESDC, Employment and Social Development Canada. As soon as we receive an email with COVID-19 guide for temporary and foreign workers in Canada available in English, French, and Spanish from ESDC, we decide to share through Facebook live video. The message will be quickly reach more workers and be shared among themselves. And it worker, as we start receiving messages from the workers, taking them as they started letting them out with some safety and care protocols. Since our program, we have implemented our training sessions for workers in a virtual way to prevent all care, all the workers. Just two weeks ago, we received a call from workers who, for personal reasons, had to see his country of origin and back in Canada was staging in a hotel in Chilliwack. And on his first day, only receiving two meals. Hotel meals are usually are small. So we asked our food bank for help who, who gave us milk, yogurt, bread, ham, cereal, fruit like mandarins, apples, and bananas. For Three consecutive days, uh, the workers sent messages thanking us for the food receiving, which we left at the hotel reception. Every day, we continue to adapt and help according to the needs and change that this pandemic has brought. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to welcome our next presenter, Sasha Login. Thank you. 
Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you to uh, all uh, my other presenters, Sabrina and Lynn. Um, I think we have a we have we cover all different aspects of uh, how we work with migrant workers. Uh, my name is Sasha Login, and I'm the project director at Skina Diversity Society in Terrace, BC. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that Skina Diversity is located on the traditional territory of the Shimshan First Nations people. And a little, little bit um, of uh, where we are located. Uh, so we are located in the uh, northwest uh, of, uh, of British Columbia. Um, as um, everybody sort of is from a different region, uh, we are, uh, that's our small part of the world. And um, just as a perspective, uh, the circle represents uh, roughly about 200 kilometers of uh, radius and uh, we have four communities in the Northwest and each of them has uh, one organization uh, that serves, um, um, that provides settlement services, including to migrant workers. Uh, Skina Diversity um, has, um, is a small organization and we have uh, been uh, created uh, 20 years ago uh, as an organization to address institutional racism uh, we continue to, to work on that and have been adding uh, more services to, uh, to newcomers. Um, 2010 opened a welcome center and 2014 started delivering uh, direct settlement services. Um, and we receive funding from IRCC. And, as, and in BC, we are quite fortunate that BC government provides a small portion, which probably represents for us only about 15% of the funding, but it opens the doors for us to work with migrant workers. Um, we provide a um, variety of services from informal language training, settlement services, employment related and community connections. So here's a little bit of a pre-COVID uh, pre activities. Um, we do many cross-cultural multi-generational activities like and we uh, use up and stretch uh, the center that we have. So uh, here are just a few uh, things. International cooking has been a program that we have been running for over five years, um, bringing people together and sharing culture and um, coming together. And, um, and also we hosted uh, different outdoor activities like block parties with our local businesses. Um, and uh, English training, uh, relying on uh, on many volunteers. So, like everybody else, um, on March 16th we receive uh, the order to close, and we have um, quickly put our heads together as a staff um, and trying to figure out learning different tools that we wanted to learn but never really had time. So first we focused on uh, how are we going to deliver our first services, especially um, the one-on-one -on -one English training. So we transition uh, in the afternoon, first starting with whereby and then Zoom uh, connecting with our clients. And, uh, and at the same time, we have really, uh, we're looking at how we reach out to all the uh, all our clients, including my migrant workers um, in the community, because uh, they have always been, they are um, already suffering through a lot of uh, challenging uh, ways of being migrant workers. And the pandemic um, has increased that. And, you know, as we all across Canada um, have, been, have been looking at it to figure out how best to serve migrant workers. I should point out that the migrant workers in our community, um, majority of them work in the hospitality industry. So it's uh, anything from fast food restaurants to hotels. So the, um, their experience would be, some of them would be laid off and some of them have been asked to work longer hours or split shifts. And uh, many of the immigrants come from Asian countries um, like South Korea. Uh, in Japan, and they've been experiencing racism in the community and at work. So um, we have really turned into 
from information and language training during the online sessions to providing supports and connections uh, with the outside world. Uh, and sometimes just listening and being the supports and counseling. And our staff, which is just four of us, and uh, have met daily and brainstormed new ideas and provided support for each other. And I have to say that our staff has been really remarkable in being um, hugely creative, adaptive, and, and flexible. And uh, I think we all got through this um, supporting each other. So in April, um, what the main thing was how do we help people connect with all the all, all the different benefits coming down uh, from the government. So we created step-by-step -step guides uh, on how to apply and provided the support online, by phone, by email, in messaging, any different ways. Um, WorkSafe BC guidelines for those that have been working, again, uh, uh, specific to different fields, uh, explaining travel exemptions and possibility for uniting families. We have worked with our local MPs office, which was very helpful. Um, and we have uh, turned to weekly newsletters and on social media, uh, sharing daily ideas and inspirations. And uh, like many of us, uh, I imagine we have been tuned and getting, getting uh, our information from the daily briefings of uh, Prime Minister, uh, information through BC government, AMSAM, and the Migrant Worker Hub uh, locally uh, through our Chamber of Commerce and City of Terrace, Migrant Worker Center, WorkSafe BC, and People's Law Schools, and many others. In May, um, so we kind of got everybody uh, information sharing and we thought, okay, we have to add some element of, of connection and fun. And so our online, uh, our international cooking program has turned online and is creating filmmakers out of all of us and sharing it on Zoom. So we have done that weekly basis and also created a group conversation on Zoom. In June, uh, we have reopened our office uh, for um, just, a, just very limited partial ways of inviting individuals or families and continuing online programs. But we felt, um, and we have, we have posted uh, our signs on how people can enter and um, what we are offering. But we felt that still wasn't enough and so in July, uh, we have come up with outdoor uh, field trips and invited uh, people to join. Uh, we managed to pick Tuesday because that was the day when most uh, people had were off. That was their off day. And uh, it has just really taken off, um, providing a weekly connections and interactions, exploring terrace and area, and providing physical activity and mental break, which was critically important. Uh, here's just some of the some of the trips. So we have uh, we have done that weekly um, throughout the summer and into early fall until the end of October. And we have actually managed to host uh, a block party, uh, which was scaled down, but uh, happened. And then. Um, in September, one of uh, another program that we have done connecting storytellers, which are often newcomers with local artists uh, and creating a and continuing program that we have done in the past where the, uh, where the two meet and the artist creates a painting based on the story of the, of the storyteller. And then the unveiling we hosted as a Zoom party and everybody, every newcomer got their painting. So that was a, also a really important um, program to connect people. And just last month, uh, uh, we hosted the outdoor Halloween um, party with a haunted tent, uh, ha haunted tent, tent uh, outside. And uh, we have seen over 300 people with everybody social distance and masked going through 
um, again, the really the idea was to provide um, opportunities for people to have a somewhat of a normal life connecting and coming out. So we had many, many of the newcomers, migrant workers uh, volunteering at that event. So the program delivery during pandemic, uh, really focusing on the hybrid model and uh, basing it from online and phone appointment uh, bookings, limited in person for individuals, families on daily basis, online one-on-one -on -one sessions, outdoor activities, uh, online group sessions, uh, online dialogues and special events, outdoor events and special activities, newsletters um, and messaging and social media posts um, all together um, trying to support people and keep them informed and connected. And these are just of the few um, uh, client feedback that we received from people. Um, we really realized early on that uh, we often providing, and all of us, uh, we provide the connection and the information and help navigate. And we always try to put ourselves in the shoes of um, migrant workers, especially being here, uh, uh, so re arriving so recently, not really knowing anybody. Um, and their only connection normally is their work workplace. Um, so yeah, trying to provide it support and some of the things that we have learned is really reaching out and checking in with everyone um, providing timely information in a, in a understandable ways establishing communication lines that work best using different tools uh, being flexible and adaptable everyone's situation may be different listening and seeking frequent feedback encouraging innovative ideas and adapting programs to online delivery, uh, creating community connections in new ways, inviting participation, uh, finding and having fun together and uh, learning together. Um, and so that uh, that's how we got through the first part of the first wave and uh, hopefully that makes us stronger moving forward. So here is, I'll leave just my contact information if um, anybody has any questions, but thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass it back to Sabrina. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, um, Sasha, Claudia, Lynn, for your fabulous presentations. It was really great to see all the different connection points from various different perspectives around supporting migrant workers. And so we've come now to the time in our session where we have, we'd like to have a Q and A discussion with you. And so you can use Slido to submit your questions and the event code is PTP 2020. And then once you're in Slido, on the top left hand side, select the workshop room that you'd like to enter. And so this is the workshop room supporting migrant workers as essential workers. And so there has been already some questions been submitted so you can vote on those rank and, and add your own questions. So and the first question that, and I know Sasha, you touched a little bit upon this in your, in your last slide, but I'll just open this one for everyone. Now that we're in the midst of the second wave of the pandemic, what are some of the learnings from the first wave that you're going to be looking to implement and how did you look to prepare for the second wave of the pandemic? Maybe I'll, I'll just get started um, being unmuted. And um, I, I think what it is, is that we know a bit more than we did uh, back in March. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's really a tough one because people are tired and people are, um, uh, on one hand, we are maybe, maybe more ready in terms of our programs and uh, beefing up and, and sort of building capacity for more online tools, um, but using more online tools. But at the same time, I think we are maybe dealing with a society that is tired 
Um, there's a lot of uh, different messaging um, in some ways. So I think um, sort of building up um, uh, self or kind of building up the, the community connections and sort of element of um, uh, support and fun is, um, is also important. Uh, moving forward. Yeah, so we are looking at uh, different different conversations and and uh, hands on workshops and different things like that that we can do online. Um, rather than in person, but sort of outside of um, of just learning and um, and information sharing. I don't have much to add, Sabrina, but I'll just share that one of the things we were careful to do when we were able to connect in person again was to make sure we had um, various channels of contact information for people who may need our assistance if we go into more of a lockdown scenario again. So that's um, a helpful piece of the puzzle. Um, but yeah. Other than that, um, I, I think what we were able to do in phase one collectively as a sector, I think, uh, is largely still relevant and applicable into um, wave two. Um, for us, uh, we try to build in uh, some um, helping from the employers because in this part, uh, we learning about, um, in our way, we learning how to use like a virtual tools, but also we need to teach how the workers can use these tools. And it's, it's just a few months, yes, it's no long time, uh, especially when we notice uh, our clients, most of the, our clients, seasonal farm workers, and temporary and foreign working in agriculture sector, his level of education is really low. And also sometimes don't have like a Wi-Fi or something like that in his farms. And this is the way uh, we try to help him uh, try to connect with the employers and the employers try to help us to help the workers. Uh, the, yes, now this is something uh, we try to fix and we try to teach employees like our workers, but also we need to teach employers um, what is the importance uh, these, it's, these employees can receive this uh, training or sessions, how can use it, uh, all the tools we try to deliver now for the pandemic. Thank you so much. Yes, it was, it was only a short time. It seems like it was so, such a long time ago, but really the pandemic has only been a short time and there's only, there was only the short time frame between the first and wave and the second wave. So there was a lot of learning, but also looking for, for rest and, and, and kind of navigating and planning that was involved. A question was posted in Slido and this one's directed to you, Lynn. Um, during your presentation, you mentioned a slogan good enough to work, good enough to stay. Could you unpack that? And is that part of a certain campaign or how did that slogan come about? Thanks, Sabrina. And thanks um, for whoever posed the question. The first time I heard that slogan was actually in 2009. Um, so again, th that image was a recent image, um, but I think it, it just highlights again, if I can call it this, the sort of silver lining of COVID, which is that these inequities and challenges and issues already existed within the migrant worker program, as well as in many other aspects of, of our society. Um, and COVID has now revealed a lot of those in a larger way. Um, so I can't, I mean, like any public Thing. I can't give anyone credit for it. I don't know who first coined the slogan, but I think it's an apt one for us to, to take forward. Um, I mean, we know that immigration levels are set to increase, and um, which is great. And meanwhile, we also have a lot of people in Canada um, who would love to be here permanently. Um, and 
one other thing that didn't come up in this presentation is this idea of temporary in the temporary foreign worker program because of course we know that often the same workers are coming back season after season year after year um, so it's not really a temporary program anyways so so why not um, approach it from the win-win of permanent pathways thank you so much lynn sasha the next question is specifically for you and the question is do you provide communications connections to migrant workers what is your funding or sorry community connections to migrant workers what is the funding i live in a rural community as well and we don't have government funded services for temporary foreign workers um we um yeah so community connection is uh, very important to um to to our work that we are doing and um uh, we are able to um connected with uh, some of the work that, uh, some of the funding that we receive from um, as BC government, um, but also um, we have number of uh, volunteers. And so we are engaging uh, through that. Um, I think that uh, to develop a sense of belonging and um, augment the situation that uh, migrant workers are often um, working and living in, it's, uh, it's extremely important to um, sort of normalize the rest of their, their lives. And uh, uh, they have been very, very receptive. And often when people kind of um, get, to know, get to be participating in the programs, then they become, become volunteers. Like for instance, um, say we're doing the international cooking programs. So we really encourage um, uh, the temporary foreign workers uh, that are participating to also be the chefs and, and sharing their uh, cooking. Um, before the pandemic in person and now now online. Um, and so trying to sort of um, build on the interests and talents um, that migrant workers bring into the community and and uh, really providing sort of ways that they can use those those talents. Great, thank you so much. Another question, and this is for, for everyone, is what are some of your suggestions around how service providers can do outreach to, to specifically agricultural workers when there's that distance between them, particularly in their rural and urban settings? So um, people would love to hear some of your outreach strategies and how have you been really looking to, to connect and build those relationships and find out where migrant workers are located? I guess I'll jump in there, Sabrina. Um, one of the ways that we connect is via employers, and I'm hoping that the new employee, employer registry in BC is going to help us do that. Um, I don't know yet what that's going to, to look like, but what we do, for example, is um, pulling the list of LMIAs as someone else pointed out that doesn't necessarily um, connect directly with with migrant workers and one of the challenges there as well is that often uh, LMIAs have been applied for through a numbered company or through a head office that's maybe in a different province so um, so partly on on our end in a smaller center in a rural area that has a lot of these farms it's direct relationships with the employers that really make a difference. And so I think um, in terms of service for farm workers, it is, or for any worker, it's important that the service is locally available, I guess is what I'm saying. I think that those relationships um, really go a long way in terms of protecting migrant workers. Thank you, Claudia. Sasha, did you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, I agree with Lynn. Uh, we need uh, building uh, some um, trusted and some partnership with employers. And also, um, we outreach workers uh, 
we, we are in a small city, Abbotsford is a small city, and also Fraser Valley is a small because all the cities are small. And we started working many years ago. This is the reason uh, we, we do outreach in stores work uh, workers are frequently used like a latin stores before not this year for the COVID, but before but now for us it's not too many outreach because um, many in many cases we receive messages uh, from other provinces too because uh, uh, workers pass our whatsapp number uh, through the um, trusted have it before and uh, this is how we we are connect with workers but many years ago we tried to uh, do something with the employers too because uh, we understand it's like a uh, it's like a group uh, working force and we need working together to build in and get more results thank you sabrina Okay, I'll just um, jump in. We don't work with migrant workers uh, in an agriculture field, but um, what building on what Claudia said is uh, uh, what's really important in uh, connecting with any temporary foreign workers is really building trust. And over the over the years, uh, we now very much rely on uh, word of mouth and building uh, partnerships with employers and supporting their workers. So it's really knowing the community and knowing who is working there and building building trust. Um, the, that's what the work is really based on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for all of your suggestions and ideas. And, and so a question came up, Lynn, just building upon what, what you mentioned in terms of that dedicated outreach um, and so if you could maybe explain how you've done that outreach in terms of looking to connect with employers, do you just go to knock on their doors or how do you approach it? Um, this is probably what you, the work that you probably put in pre-COVID, um, but how did you go about doing that to build those connections? Thanks for the question. Yeah, definitely a lot of it was pre-COVID. Part of it is the merits of a smaller center where, where people are more interconnected and where we're able to leverage uh, personal connections in our work as well. But I think um, hosting, you know, there's there's got to be a, a an offer right, that you come to the door with. So for example, we've hosted, even during COVID, we, we hosted them online, um, trainings for employers of migrant workers who have questions about um, rights and responsibilities, essentially. And we've hosted those um, with experts like immigration consultants, you know, people who can answer their questions. Even at the front end, we've hosted workshops like that, where prospective employers who are considering hosting migrant workers um, can learn more about the program and about what takes place um, once folks are here. And we've even invited um, employer champions to that table, people who have um, done what I'll say is a good job of hosting um, temporary foreign workers that can be in the room as well to answer questions that other employers have. So it's really, um, it's a long term game. It's that process of relationship building. Um, and then that opens the door to, to access for the workers and in a way where employers aren't suspicious or, um, or, or workers don't perceive their employers to be suspicious of them accessing services. So it really um, helps pave the way. And for us, we helping workers to get social insurance numbers and also we helping uh, to, when, when the workers need go to like a medical, like a walking clinic or something like that. And this is how we start connect with employers because for many years we doing this service, we provide this service and, and some supervisors start trusting us and pass our number to the employers and when the workers arrive now we receive uh, many calls from employers to need help to 
get the employees, get help to the get the social insurance number. And this is how we start building our connection with the employers. Also, um, for example, last year in 2019, we we have the opportunity to do three different uh, health fairs, and our numbers are very big. For example, one in Abbott for one 350 workers at them, and also um, uh, we try invite employers to see what we do, what what is the service we provide. Uh, but this is the job we, we start many years ago. Yes, our program started in 2001. And this is something is a slow, but it's something um, we get because we working very hard in trusted and the workers trusting us pass our name to the supervisor and the supervisor pass the name to the employer um, but yes this is this is how we connect with employers thank you so much claudia sasha do you have anything to add maybe how you've been looking to connect with employers as they aren't in the agricultural sector yeah, very similar, um, um, like um, Lynn and Claudia mentioned, um, providing, explaining the services that we provide and uh, provide information, especially around um, employment standards and, um, you know, sort of explaining the pathways to when, when trying to hire um, temporary foreign workers, yeah, providing information, but then building the connection. And then, of course, as, as Lynn uh, mentioned, uh, we see um, employers that are um, uh, supportive of, uh, of uh, migrant workers, and we see those that there is uh, um, definitely um, questionable. Uh, or could be improved uh, employment standards, uh, so we try to sort of support, um, because if we go head on that they might cut off um, uh, workers from uh, being able to access our services. Yeah, so many different ways, but uh, yeah, definitely information sharing and uh, building partnerships um, across different sectors. Perfect, thank you. I think definitely that there is um, the key word is building those partnerships, relationships, and that it that it does take its time. And I know that many of you have been working for, for many years in your organizations for many years and in, in supporting migrant workers. And so our final question, as we just have two minutes left, is what information or resource would you wish you had to better support migrant workers? Is there one thing that you had or one resource that that you see that there's a gap or a need and you wish you had it to better support migrant workers? Um, maybe we'll start this time with you, Claudia. Could you please repeat the question, Sabrina? Sorry. Sorry, it's um, what information or what resource do you wish you had so that you could better support migrant workers? Is there something that's missing in terms of information that you would need or a resource to support migrant workers? <laughs> Okay, I think uh, uh, the way we see it uh, is like um, um, helping in, in his own language. Uh, this is the more important because we, we, we know everything is online, we can find a lot of resources, but when we try to search, we know everything is usually English or, is, or, or French. And, and when some organizations like a government organization, for example, or, or other organizations um, try to help in other language, we find the barrier is not all the contents. I mean, it's just a, a, a little part is translated in other language, but not all the full uh, content uh, we can find in English or French. I know maybe it's very hard because we need many different language when we're talking about temporary and foreign workers. Yes, for us, for example, in agriculture, uh, we reduce in less because we, we try to detect the majority uh, numbers of workers. But I know when we're talking about other sectors, we have people from 
all the countries and, and, and it's something we need to try to help. And for this, we need more resources, yes, like a more funding because it's expensive pay for translation, especially when we try to translate uh, something is uh, by law because uh, in, in, when we're talking about migration matters, uh, this is something changed very quick and maybe we need a um, update very frequently. And yes, this is why I see it. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Yes, resources and, and the client's first language is always, is always a resource that it's more and more in need. Um, Sasha, just very briefly, is there a resource or, um, information that, that you think you would require to be able to better support migrant workers? Yeah, uh, I really feel that having being able to have more time to work with, with migrant workers because their needs are, I would often say higher because they just newly arrived. Um, we're looking at different partnerships and sources of funding to be able to provide um, laptops um, because uh, the digital world is um, is increasing. And I'm really hopeful to see the advocacy on the national level for uh, more supports for temporary residents. Perfect, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, very briefly, I guess um, it gives me an opportunity to give a shout out again to the Migrant work Worker Hub uh, that AMSA has created and that need for a repository for all the information from all different sources in, uh, in an easy, you know, one stop shop for workers for settlement workers or or others that are serving migrant workers and to echo what Claudia was saying having it available in workers first language either via the person that's delivering the service or the resource itself um, is invaluable perfect thank you so much and so we've come to the end of today's presentation and so I just wanted to thank my fellow presenters Claudia Storr, Sasha Laga, Logan and Lynn Weaver as well. I just want to thank um, Pathways to Prosperity for this opportunity as well as Employment and Social Development Canada, WorkSafe BC and the province of, of British Columbia for funding some of these different resources um, and, and product projects. And so if you'd like to access some of the resources that we were sharing and talking about, um, you can go to migrantworkerhub.ca and that's the repository of migrant worker specific resources that AMSA has. So thank you so much um, for joining us today and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>